Welcome everyone. Thank you for coming out and for our latest installment of the amendments uh, presented by Meg Mott. As always, I have a few people to thank. Um, first of all, I thank Meg for bringing this to us. It's um, been such a great series and the Fourth Amendment is near and dear to the hearts of librarians because we are all about privacy and confidentiality. And so I actually printed off the um, Vermont statutes that cover confidentiality for all of you. So if you'd like to pick one up on your way out, please check out at the, at the front desk. Um, as you know, confidentiality and privacy is a pillar of the, uh, the profession of librarianship. And um, we have the Friends of the Library to thank for sponsoring this program. So if you are not a member of the Friends and you would like to be, also you can get information about that at the back desk as well. Um, I am also especially grateful to Neely, Bur uh, Neely Bruce and Sue Birch for bringing us the wonderful treat of our singers. And with that, I will turn it over to Meg Mott and she'll do the, she'll work her magic. All right, thank you, Star. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for coming out for this discussion on the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and it's nice to see some familiar faces, some people who've been here for the last couple of amendments and some new faces as well. Uh, if you haven't been for the, to the first two, not to worry. Uh, we're gonna start from scratch. And if I refer back, I'll make sure that we understand everybody's on the same page as we're going forward. They are one piece, the Bill of Rights. And so sometimes there are references to the other ones, but today we're really, really, tonight we're gonna to focus on the Fourth Amendment. Um, and the Fourth, um, Starr said that it was near and dear to librarians' hearts. I want to say it's near and dear to feminist hearts. However, part of the discussion tonight is to show how, uh, much to perhaps, I'm gonna say my dismay, there have been changes in feminist jurisprudence which actually have had a uh, negative effect on privacy. So that's one of the things we're gonna talk about tonight. I wore these colors. Anybody know what these colors are? Purple and white, yes, but you know what they, what they re uh, represent? I'm always trying, I, I heard something. I, yes, great, Oliver, uh, very good vision here. Purple and white. I heard that people never remember what you say. They always remember what you wore. So that's why I, I make a big deal about like, okay, this is what I'm wearing tonight, hoping there's some little mnemonic device that happens. And you say, oh yeah, that was when she was wearing purple and white. Anybody know what purple and white? Lynn, were you gonna say something? Suffrage, the suffragettes, this was their colors. So um, I am standing strong with 19th century feminism. And then we'll see what happened in the 20th century with feminism. And maybe, you know, we, we can uh, right this ship or maybe you'll say, you know what, Meg, when it comes to certain things, I don't care about privacy. So that'll be part of our conversation. But we're gonna begin, as we do always now, in Brattleboro, we get the people together, we have our sacred text, and then we have the Constitution Choir. <laughs> so, um, and Neely Bruce, who comes up from Wesleyan, Connecticut, who has composed an entire series of uh, motets to the Bill of Rights, is working with Connecticut singers and our local Brattleboro, Wyndham County singers, um, and um, pay attention when they sing, because we're gonna spend a lot of time thinking about how to interpret this amendment. And pay attention to how Neely has decided to arrange this. What words does he repeat? How does he situate certain of these phrases? So we're gonna start with the, chor the choir singing the, the segment of the Constitution, and then we're gonna start to play on how to interpret it. The right of the people to be secure. The right of the people to be secure. The right of the people to be secure. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, Papers and effects in their persons, houses, papers and effects. Against unreasonable searches and seizures. 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 
time we met, there was some discussion about how is it that people are interpreting these different amendments. And there was a conversation about what's the difference between interpretation and construction and interpretation and analysis. It was a whole conversation we had last um, uh, for our Second Amendment discussion. Because so much of what we're doing here is interpreting what the Constitution says. Neely is interpreting it musically. He's setting up certain passages again and again to give them extra effort. He's showing sometimes there's a round, sometimes it's in unison. We're following his mind as he's making all these decisions. Um, so we're gonna go through looking at what it means to interpret the Constitution. And um, luckily, I'm not gonna make this up. I'm just going to go to how did Supreme Court justices from the very beginning learn to interpret the Constitution. They actually have several kinds of methods. And the guy who came up with this is Justice John Marshall, not the first Supreme Court Justice, but the one who turned the Supreme Court from a prop into a protagonist. Boy, did that guy understand, how, understand what it means to interpret something so that he could have lots more energy. So, First thing he figured out is, what do you do when you're trying to figure out what the amendment means? You look at the text. This I'm gonna be able to put the singers on the spot. What do you think this particular text means? But the rest of you also, feel free to jump in. Um, besides the text, which is the actual words on the page, another way to understand it is through the historical context. What was going on at the time? How did people understand what these words meant? So that's uh, a lot of times when people talk about original intent, that's what they mean. What did people really mean when they wrote those words down in the 18th century? Political theory, that's my favorite. What's the big, big picture? We did that a little bit last time when we were talking about a Republican form of government. Uh, and what did that mean, a Republican form of government? Well, that's political theory. Not only we're we looking at the words, we're looking at a large, a philosophical system on how we're supposed to rule ourselves. We have consequences. John Marshall used all these in a famous case, McCullough versus Maryland. Very savvy guy. He understood, I can read it with the words. I can read it with what they were thinking at the time. I can read it in terms of what the consequences are. And I can read it in terms of political theory around Republican form of government, federalism. Um, and uh, the fourth one is consequences. What are the effects of a certain ruling? If you think it means this, 
what are going to be the national effects. Um, you could say that Justice Roberts did that with the recent decision around the Affordable Care Act. Part of his reasoning was he didn't want to throw the entire nation into a state of chaos if he had just thrown it out. So the consequences, that was something John Marshall used back in the day in the very early 1800s. And then the last one is usually what people know, they think stare decisis. The, the interpretation is based on previous interpretations. So we've got one that's rooted in the past, we've got one that's rooted in the future. Ah, you see what it means to be able to interpret the Constitution? You can use whatever game you want. It's like being a carpenter. I'm looking at some carpenters here. So sometimes you need a sawzall. Sometimes you need a jigsaw. Sometimes you need a hammer, right? You're always like looking at what kind of tool. So um, all of these are at our disposal in trying to figure out what does that Fourth Amendment mean? Because there's a lot going on there. So let's go first to the text, the right of the people. Singers, what do you think that means? You sang that a lot, again and again and again. What do you think it means? Rights. Maddie is saying inherent rights. Yeah, and, and what does that mean, Maddie? Well, it's not just something plastered on, it's not just something that flagged away, but it's, these are basic rights, basic rights uh -huh. that um, dot, 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 can't be taken away. Right. Maybe. right. So that we could think of it as fundamental rights can't be taken away. Um, and who does it pertain to? The people. So, right, everybody's nodding. So what is this thing called people? We talked about this a lot for the Second Amendment, right? Because a militia was a rights of the people for the Second Amendment? Or is it a, a, is it a right of all the different persons in this room? So it was white landowners, male. Pretty much to start with. Alan, Alan is saying the, the right of the people, white, landowners, male, right? That there was all these different ideas in order to be a, a member of that right of the people. Uh, certainly the purple and white ladies didn't have a p position in that. Um, yeah, so, so what is this? We have two different responses. Inalienable right, inherent, can't be taken away. Then we have Alan saying, well, actually, right of the people, very small subset of the population. Inherent, small subset. What is this term? We sang it many, many times. Um, so here, this right, whenever you hear that term, right of the people, we get in this big problem. It's a collective right, or is it? Originally, it was a collective right. The right of the people was not the persons, all these individuals, especially since so many of them don't even get to participate, but something collective, the people's right. Communists, perhaps, is that, but were the, was the Ameri, this is Daniel, who's a uh, peanut gallery over there. Um, is, is it communists who are part of the founding of this political theory? No, you're, you're saying like, what is Daniel talking about? He should stick with technology, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But if it's the peoples. Yeah, so who are these people? Do we have a sense? Speaking to his microphone. What? <laughs> Is, <laughs> Daniel, did you have an answer? Um, I missed it. She said unfair advantage. Unf you had one with the mic. Oh, it's because right. you're hogging the mic, Daniel. R right. So, wh so but what do you think about this collective right? Well, isn't a collective right at the foundation of communism as well? Could, Supposedly. Yeah, that, but we're talking the... Yeah, he's, we're, he's struggling right now. We're, we're going to take the mic off because he's probably feeling like, would you not put me in the public limelight right now? Let's let, like, let you have that little private space. So this is what uh, a collective would be understood in the 18th century and in the early 19th century. Ooh. It protects public officials in the course of public affairs. Whenever the people are gathered in public to do the people's business, that's the right of the people. It's not a group of individuals with their personal rights. It's kind of like our militia that we talked about with the Second Amendment. It's a collective group of people, certain kind of people, Matt. Oh, although to jump ahead a little bit, do the people have houses? Ah. I mean, that collective group of people you're talking about for public affairs, that to me doesn't 
jibe well with in their houses, which comes up right yeah, soon here. Right soon, because you're one of those singers, aren't you, Matt? <laughs> yes. Okay, so let's move a little bit forward uh, to be secure in their persons. Wow. Collective right, that's about political life, that's about public officials doing public things. They have a right to be secure in their persons. That sounds awfully individualistic. In their houses, in their papers and effects. It is a confusing amendment. Our little brains should be going Just the way our brains go when we think, yes, it's all about equality, it's all about freedom, how come half the population couldn't vote? not until the 19th Amendment. Oh yeah, it's all about equality, it's all about freedom. Why are there these slave states where you couldn't talk about getting rid of slavery regardless of your race? There was no First Amendment protection in slave states. No freedom of assembly in slave states. So we've, we've got this little It's happening anyway, but it's happening right there even in our sentence. Public, private. What do you think it means to be secure in your person? What does that mean? Can't haul you off to jail. They can't haul you off to jail. Orion? Orion, yes. Um, so, because, how, what would that look like? To be secure in your person. You should be able to walk down the street if you're a law-abiding citizen and not be hauled off to jail, right? They have to say why. They have to say why, yeah, as you're walking down the street. Yeah. Um, yeah. It turns out that some of these ideas, yes. Oh, yes, and your name, I forget it. I should know Calvin. it. Calvin. Calvin. Uh, I great. just wanted to point out that in the past century, uh, the word person has been reinterpreted quite drastically. Yes, yeah. So Calvin uh, said, that everybody here, that the word person has been reinterpreted quite drastically. Are you talking about uh, a corporation as a person? Yeah, and, and that actually, I, we have, I periodically have little conversations about this. It does go back to medieval canon law, where corporations were persons, they were legal fictions persons. I know it's gone much further over advanced capitalism, but anyway, I always feel like, obviously I feel like people should know that. Um, the idea about being secure in one's person is actually kind of confusing. Orion is right that we should not feel like we can just be hauled off to jail without probable cause. And there is that language, as the singers will tell us, in the amendment. But this whole idea of what does it mean to be secure in your person is, a, um, is going to be part of our conversation as we go through the history of how people understood this. The one thing that Americans completely get is to be secure in your house. You can find all sorts of things that say, like, come back with a warrant. And the idea of, of uh, Alan mentioned how property ownership was key to this whole um, form of government that we created. So having property, having a home, that that becomes a place where you can have very specific protections, where you can shut the door on the uh, police officer if they don't have a warrant. And that's very much in our consciousness. But how that fits in terms of our personhood, that's still a little bit, um, wasn't quite clear, and, and I'll get to some cases that'll make it clear. So um, another thing they say is against unreasonable searches and seizures. If we're looking at the text, is there any term there that seems a little vague? Unreasonable, unreasonable. exactly. What is this term, unreasonable? Who decides whether the search is unreasonable? Yeah, I mean, wh when you have a search, who, who decides whether it's unreasonable? Any ideas? The court, Oliver's saying the court, that would be one uh, answer. The person. The person? The person who has been searched should be able to make that claim, absolutely. And the police often, and we'll see when that arose. Um, so, just by looking at the text, we've got some questions. And the other one is, when is unreasonableness determined? If it's a police officer, it's before the event. This seems reasonable, I'm going to stop this car. I think there's bootleg liquor in it. Or, I feel like, as you were saying, can you just tell us your name? Anne. As Anne was saying, the person who has been, their, their uh, constitutional protections have been violated, they get to bring it to a court, then maybe a jury decides. 
So let's look at a, couple, a little bit more of the text, and then we're going to go to the historical context. So we begin to understand some of the answers to all these questions. No warrants shall issue but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation. Particularly, that's a key term here, describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Yeah, particularly, that was a big word. The chorus kept saying it. What are, the, what are they afraid of? Lynn is saying, yeah, the, they wrote this language because they want to make sure that you can't just go in on a fishing expedition. You may get a warrant, but it had better be specific, incredibly specific. You can't just give somebody a warrant and say, yeah, like, go into Uncle Sam's place of residence. Uncle Sam took off his hat, but Uncle Sam's right over there, and, and go looking for whatever. That's, that's wrong. I, I'm glad you all are nodding. Like. Alan is saying once you have the right to get in, it seems like you should be able, it, that you can't, it seems, suggesting, Alan, that maybe you think p police officers may do that, or detectives, law and order, have you been watching? <laughs> or something of that sort, that people get in there and then all of a sudden they start looking for all sorts of things. And, and that's a big fear, that you would think particularly, right? We've got it in print, the text is so clear, particularly should constrain just that kind of fishing expedition. So let's look at the historical context, because that will help us understand why were the people who wrote this, the framers we call them, so interested in this problem of warrants that were not particular. So there's a very famous case, um, Wilkes v. Wood. I couldn't find a picture from 1763. This picture is from 1768. But there's Mr. Wilkes. He's standing there. He's a Whig on the right. And um, he was, they called him the 18th century um, analog to the Drudge Report. So what is, is that Matthew Drudge? Is that the guy's name? Anyway, he's that kind of a writer. He's saying all sorts of things about the king. Many of them are quite lewd. So that's that 18th century kind of way of talking in which he was making all sorts of claims about the king not just how he was running the government, but probably also who was sleeping with whose mother. That would be the sort of thing they would be talking about. So he writes all of this, and um, his name is John Wilkes. Anybody know Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania? There's all, like, at this time, people in the United States loved this guy. They just thought he was the greatest thing in the world, right? Because he's speaking truth to power and being kind of devilish in the way he did it. Um, so um, he is written, he's written all these things about the king. He's a member of parliament. So talk about the people's right. He's a member of parliament engaging in the people's business. And he's saying all these libelous things because he's writing them down, although he didn't be like that. He was like this with a little quill. He's writing them down. And um, the king sends his magistrate in and goes into Wilkes's apartments in London. And just as Alan suspected, they look into everything. They just go wild. They look, 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 look. He says this is wrong. So he has already been invaded. His, vi his privacy has been violated. He takes it to the court. And Lord Camden, anybody know Camden, New Jersey? This is how the people back then, they go, we love these people. We love the way they're talking. We're going to put it on our children's birth certificates or in the town that we're just incorporating. Lord Camden makes a big decision. Remember, this is a member of parliament saying very nasty things about the king. And he says, the offense of libel did not justify seizing private papers. Sure, he may have said nasty things in print about you, but you don't go into his place of domicile. You don't go rummaging around in his desk. You don't pull things out from under the bed. You don't look at his diaries. You don't do that. Common law did not permit seizure of papers for mere evidence. So don't go looking for something which then you can turn into evidence. You've got the evidence, that's the libel. You've got what he uh, published in public. You want to make a libel suit? Go ahead, make a libel suit. But you do not go looking for more evidence. And um, 
Paper searches amount to a kind of compelled self-incrimination. Can you see how excited they might have been as they were thinking about their Bill of Rights? The right to not have your papers looked at means it's a little bit like what we're going to talk about next month on September 11th, Fifth Amendment. If you start going through people's things, you are making them incriminate themselves. They threw it out also because Wilkes is a member of parliament. If you're a member of parliament, you have that public uh, responsibility. You are not going to be charged with libel. So they throw out the case. In fact, the jury gives them a thousand pounds, which was quite a bit of money in those days. Then a few years later, when I showed you that picture from before, he does something very, very similar. He doesn't get off, uh, and he has to leave the country, but he just, you know, he upped his game. He upped his game. <laughs> and they also changed the law so that it turned out you could be a member of parliament and subject to libel laws. So, um, something else before we get into the more current situation, Oops, let's see, I'll just do this. Um, and that is, you all talked about unreasonableness in your singing, but you also spent a lot of time talking about that warrant. So there's these two different paths to justice that was happening at that time. And one is trying to figure out what is reasonableness, and that you go to a jury. And the jury is going to determine, just as Anne was saying, the person brings something to the jury, the jury is going to make the, distinct, uh, the decision about whether it's reasonable or not. And it's based on evidence at the trial. And it's also populist, because a jury is the populist wing of the judicial branch. Which means if you're an uh, upstanding member of your community, it's going to be great. But this is one of the downsides, right, with juries. It could be that the jury will say, oh, we know about you, we've known about you since you were a little boy, and you were engaged in all sorts of nasty things, and we don't think you're up to standard. So uh, the reasonable standard it has a populist element, which means if you're a minority, it may not go so well. So there's this second way of understanding it, and that's through warrants. And believe me, these people were thinking about John Wilkes and what Lord Camden said, and they went to... On that side, it's issued by a magistrate, and we're hoping that magistrate loves Lord Camden. It's based on an affidavit of a prosecutor, which mm, maybe it's going to be good, maybe not. We hope that magistrate has really looked into what the evidence is that the prosecutor brings. And it's administrative, which means that there may be more protections for minorities. So the Fourth Amendment has both paths to justice. So let's start moving. Quick, yes, Daniel. Quick question. How yeah. could it be, couldn't there be the same risk to minorities, whether it was administrative or populist? It could be, um, especially if you were in um, a municipality where the magistrate was not interested in protecting constitutional freedoms. We're hoping they did an oath of office and they said they were going to protect your freedom. We should relax about the current administration. Um, at, at the moment, I think, and this is going to be this discussion, I think we have better not be relaxed about our own politics. So this one's going to be a little bit more focusing on decisions that we've made in the advancement of social justice. So uh, now we're going to go much more into the present. So there was our, we did the text, we looked at some of the historical context, and um, we got some sense of the political theory when we heard Lord Camden, who was making these principled claims for what certain rights um, protect us. So let's go to the United States and see what other um, discussions were had that started to change the notion about um, what is protected under the Fourth Amendment. You may have noticed when they were singing that they didn't say automobiles. They said persons, they said houses, they said papers, they said effects. Anybody know what the effects would mean? Stuff. stuff. Exactly. Your basic stuff. Which you might think was an automobile. But in 1925, the Supreme Court decided two things that are very big. Somebody want to read this? The seizing officer. Yeah, uh, Matt. Oh, we'll give it to Matt and then we'll get you for the next one. 
The seizing officer shall have reasonable or probable cause for believing that the automobile which he stops and seizes has contraband liquor therein. Right. So in 1925, there's this issue, prohibition, which means there's this issue, bootlegging. And so um, Justice William Howard Taft, who was President Taft, right? And then becomes, he's, I mean, another one of these amazing characters, first president and then goes to the Supreme Court. Uh, he makes this claim that an automobile is not protected. And who gets to decide whether it's reasonable or not? The officer. It's a big step in terms of changing Fourth Amendment jurisprudence. And what, the, what that decision did in 1925, it creates something called the automobile exception. And that's why. There's a picture of a very, it look, looks like they're carting wood. However, the police officers have taken, or is it bricks? Yeah, it looks like they're carting something. The police officer moves the bricks, and what do you think is behind that? Ta-da, exactly, in a word. Liquor, ta-da. Um, so, when it says shall have, does that mean must have? Huh? Or does it mean that you have to assume that he has? I think it means must have, but I'm not sure. I, Alan is bringing a very important grammatical point here shall. I mean, when you say somebody shall have something, it's almost like a promise. You shall have this power. By this decision, I am granting you this power. So when it came to automobiles, now this started to change a little bit about probable cause, like in, but being able to stop an automobile, police officers have a fair amount of discretion. And this, this is a decision that did that. They're deciding reasonableness. We thought that was going to be the juries. Ah, uh ah. -uh. Um, okay. So um, on that decision, Carol, there was this guy, Louis Brandeis. Maybe you've heard of him. He was um, for Carol. He wrote, he was not a dissenting opinion. Uh, Justice Louis, Louis Brandeis, I think, uh, was from Louisville, Kentucky. That's where I was born, so I always feel like he's one of my guys. And um, he actually, even though he signed on to this, gave us a very important right. And it's this right that we're just going to hang out with. And it, it, it kind of gets to that notion of what does it mean to be secure in a person? What is a person? Is it just our flesh and blood? Is it also maybe our sense of pride? Is it our vulnerabilities? Is it our ability to be misunderstood and then feel bad about ourselves? So this um, article that Louis Brandeis and his former law professor Samuel Warren wrote, um, I put this under reading the fourth through political theory because he's going to give us a way, he doesn't have a case in front of him. It's not as if there's a specific case and he's trying to decide that case. He's just beginning to see things happening in the United States with gossip columns uh, because Samuel Warren, his former law professor, uh, partner, had given a party and next thing you knew it showed up in the Boston papers. All these details about his private life are showing up in the Boston papers. They feel like, what's going on? Isn't there a Fourth Amendment protection? Now, let's move the, um, can we move the mic to, I'm we sorry, can. what your name is? Judith. Judith, yes, Judith. I don't need it. Oh no, yes, I, I'm, do. Judith. In this room, trust me. Judith, we, I so appreciate your um, your high notes that you gave us. <laughs> really, they were fantastic. And I don't know if you want to sing this, but or you can just speak it. Sure. Okay. The right to privacy implies the right not merely to prevent inaccurate portrayal of private life, but to prevent its being depicted at all. Yeah. You have this right to keep your life outside of the public arena. They felt that this was an essential right, such an essential right that even though the Fourth Amendment says nothing about privacy, I, the singers, did, am I making that up? Did you say privacy? No, no none of you saying privacy. Uh, but he sees all of the protections that we talked about in the Fourth Amendment as basically being this essential right to privacy. Um, they go to the principles of common law. Judith, can you keep reading this? The common law secures to each individual 
the right of determining to what extent his thoughts, sentiments, and emotions shall be communicated to others. Yeah. So Orion had talked about the right to be secure in one person is not to be hauled out to jail. And yes, that's, that's a bodily thing. We can think of bodies being removed. Your body should be able to go where it wants, and then your body should say, I haven't broken the law. You cannot apprehend me and throw me in the clinker. But they're getting at something much more spiritual, much more psychological, much more interior. You don't have to have your thoughts your ideas spread about willy-nilly. They make this claim that the inv an invasion of personal privacy affects you in these really, really basic ways. Judith, do you want to read this next line up? Affects a person's estimate of himself and his own feelings. Belittles the relative importance of things thus dwarfing the thoughts and aspiration of a people. Destroys robustness of thought and delicacy of feeling. Yeah. So here you have this, and this is published in 1890. It's not in the Constitution. It's not being said by a Supreme Court justice, because Brandeis is not a Supreme Court justice yet. But it's a very influential law review article. And they're saying what's really happening, it has to do with people's feelings. And if you take away people's privacy, they are going to have very, very low self-esteem. They are going to feel that they are insignificant. Um, and so it, talk about the rights of a people. They understand this in terms of the psyche of a nation. I'm tempted to say the mental health of a nation, the spiritual health of a nation. And that's what they feel is at stake when somebody's privacy is violated. Yeah. A, a definition of terms for a moment, and then up front. Yeah. Common law, how it, what exactly does that mean? So common law is the in, in law of England, and many of the principles, so Lord Camden, that was in England, when Wilkes was saying all those bad things about the king. Uh, so common law is the established law in England that m the, Europe, uh, the European settlers brought to the United States. So it's, a, it's uh, the bedrock underneath constitutional law. And it's carried forward into this, the thinking behind this late 1800s article? Yes, right, right. And this is where we're doing constitutional interpretation using political theory. And is that codified somewhere, that common law? Ah, interesting you should ask that. We will get there. So at the moment we just have, you know, sometimes people say, well, scripture says this, this, and this. And, and justices will use scripture. They use it in the infamous Dred Scott decision. Um, so all these sources, all these authorities get used in order to build arguments, in order to make a case about how we should interpret these amendments. So you can use all sorts of different sources. Um, so let's look at this moment there, where we actually get the Supreme Court to weigh in on this idea of privacy, the way they're talking about privacy. In 1961, Matt v. Ohio, Justice Thomas Clark says, the Fourth Amendment creates a right to privacy, no less important than any other right, carefully and particularly reserved to the people. So isn't that fascinating? You write the, you write the argument, you put it in a law review, you make a strong case, you start to get people who are reading those sort of things to think more about what could the Fourth Amendment re mean, and eventually, took a long time, 71 years, it gets the imprimatur of the Supreme Court. They say it, that's it. Now we're on to stare decisis. We have this, bit, this backbone about what privacy means in the United States. Yes, uh, did Peter. The previous uh, fellow, whose name I'm dropping already, um, also related to the Fourth Amendment when he, when he wrote that law article? Oh, um, they, I didn't find, and, and that's Peter's asking, like, do they actually cite the Fourth Amendment in the law review article? Yes, I, my memory is sometimes a little weird. They do make that claim that the Fourth Amendment is, is the basis of where they're finding that. They also go to the Fifth Amendment, because that right to not incriminate yourself. They also go to the Ninth Amendment. So they, they are sort of pulling around, but um, the Fourth Amendment is where they were leaning heavily. And so then when the Supreme Court has a case in which they can make that claim, 
They do. And now we have that. Well, privacy is not mentioned in any of those amendments. Is that right? Privacy is not mentioned in any, privacy is not mentioned in the Constitution. That word does not exist in the Constitution. Yeah, Neely. Uh, the, but isn't the title of the Brandeis article directly, the title re directly refers to the Fourth Amendment, right? The title says the right to privacy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, Okay, it, it doesn't say the Fourth Amendment in the title. I just made it. Right. Yeah. So is let's there go a back. Subtitle, subtitle let's go end? back to. But I was also going to say yeah. it just shows you how important a scholarly article can be. Yeah. So the right to privacy, yeah, it's, this shows how important a scholarly article is. So we, we don't have, a, obviously, the whole thing. Um, and no, I, I, I just misremembered it. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. But in. In that, as they're making this argument, first of all, they're really spending a lot of time on what the effects of are on a people when they don't have privacy. So they're making a big case for the right to privacy, and then they ground it in the Fourth Amendment. And so eventually the Supreme Court says, yep, that's where we saw it too. We always knew it was there, and we just saw it too. Uh, and so you can think about that in terms of that's a way of interpreting using political theory. That's how I would understand that. They're going to larger principles, and then they're saying that's what it always meant. Uh, and, okay, so, sorry, I'm, I have a machine that does this. Oh, look at it, okay, we're moving it right along. So, we're, here we are, okay. Now, um, Daniel was asking, so, how does this actually get codified? Well, in 1971, this is what you would get if you went to law school and you studied torts. There's something called restatement. There are these volumes in which they capture certain principles. And um, privacy, around privacy, it's a tort. There's four types of invasion of privacy. One is appropriation of another's name. We know about that. We actually take that very seriously, right? Identity theft, that's what we call it. Publicity that unreasonably places another in a false light. Ooh, what is that? Slander, Slander yeah, but it's like, I mean, is that something we're just like doing? This is, a, this is an invasion of privacy, which means it's a tort. You can bring a lawsuit against somebody for, for libel, for slander. Yeah, um, I mean, it also, call out culture, in my mind, engages in this. It's, uh, Lynn is saying it assumes that you know what that other person did? Yes, but if, it, if, it, if it's like it is today where it comes out of nowhere and, and no name. It's a, no no names. name is attached. Right. Well, this is publicity that's going to have a person's name or face attached to it. So if we think about it in terms of social media right now, it's very easy to do. You take a little gotcha moment and then you spread it all around. In 1971, that was understood as an invasion of privacy. Now it is standard practice. But this was understood as totally uh, detrimental to the psyche and spiritual health of the nation. And so detrimental was it that you could file a lawsuit as a tort. Yeah, Matt. Well, you still can file a lawsuit. It might be happening so frequently these days that it's hard to prevail or, you know, but certainly celebrities in particular still do and win these cases sometimes. It's not like it has stopped. Right. That it is a, a, a reason you can bring a suit. Yes, right. So Matt's point is well taken. You could still bring a suit on this. It's the question of are people realizing that, they're a, a vi uh, that they've experienced a violation of privacy? The suits are still there. Lawyers will still take the case, perhaps, if you've got a good claim, and you've got enough damages to make it worth their while. Um, unreasonable intrusion upon the solitude or seclusion of another. That's a violation of privacy, according to the restatement of torts. Like those phone calls you get at dinner time, right? Even during speeches. Even during speeches, you could be getting these phone calls. Did you just get one? Yeah. Exactly. It was, an, it was another robocall. Um, publicity to matters concerning the private life of another. Uh, this, for me, I was thinking of when people would be outed. Nowadays, it's not so big a deal, but it, for a long time, it was going to be a big deal if you were outed as a gay person. All of these are grounds. Yes, in the back, next to Charlie. 
this, this is, is all written in the 61 decision. Yeah, so this is what appears, so the 60, what was it, uh, the map case, that, make, that says uh, privacy is a right. This is now what lawyers learn as a matter of tort. This is current. This is current. Okay. You have this. I'm sorry, can you tell us on your name? Michaela. Michaela, you have this. We all have this. 1971, that's how lawyers are, are letting us know these are all ways you could sue for all four of these things. But wh So why? Why aren't we all like, yeah, okay, I knew that. I always knew I had this. Because we've, I, I, you know, invasion of privacy has been a big, big concern in this country for a very long time. Why are we not so worried? Yes, Neely. We're numb. Because we're numb. When you read these things, this is astonishing. Yeah. We're numb. We're numb. <laughs> Neely says he's numb. We could get a little B. And, you know, it's like, like uh, Socrates. He wants the gadfly and the horse, right? A little zing. So that may be, maybe all we need to be woke. Okay, this is, you've just been woke. Well, the, other, the other thing is suing somebody's hard. It's and true. it takes a lot of money to be even yeah. be able to bring a suit, right? right? Most people don't ever really seriously consider suing somebody because it's hard. Matt's saying how hard it is. And these are all very, very good reasons. Okay, this is where I have to, this is why, remember I told you I'm wearing purple and white. I was hoping you wouldn't get so mad at me for what I'm about to say. There is an explanation for why in the United States we are less concerned about privacy. Do you want to tell us in, next to Peter Amidon? Well, my name is Walter. I would Walter. concede that that we have given up uh, the right to much of that privacy quite willingly through social media yeah. and otherwise. So Walter is saying we gave it up. And this is one of those things about rights. Uh, Justice Learneth Hand said famously, liberty lies in the heart of men and women. If it dies there, no judge, no law, no court can save it. So what Walter is getting at is, did we just give it up? Okay, there's another culprit though. And no one's going to say it. So I'll just show you. And maybe my head will have to hang a little lower in this town, but I'm sorry, people. And, and I'm going to talk to about somebody who I used to be totally crushed out on. There she is, Catherine McKinnon. And Catherine McKinnon, this is another way of understanding the law using political theory. And this is a feminist theory of the state. And she looked at all this talk about privacy, and she said, who wants to read Catherine McKinnon? Do I have any volunteers? Yes, here we go. Can we get a mic? Excellent, thank you so much. The law of privacy treats the private sphere as a sphere of personal freedom. Can you keep going? Men's realm of private freedom is women's realm of collective subordination. Yeah, thank you. And, I, and when I read that, in the late 80s, and I was concerned about domestic violence, I thought, wow, she's really nailed it. And I was pretty excited by it. And then I began to see what was happening. Um, she wrote this great book, Toward a Feminist Theory of the State. It was published in 1989, and she understood sexual harassment as gender discrimination. Uh, so that's a very particular way of understanding sexual harassment. In, it, it hasn't aged well, especially as gender is becoming much more fluid. But in the 80s, this understanding that men had privacy and they used it to subordinate women, that ran quite well for a while. Um, so when she wrote this, can you, what, can you tell us your name? Sarah. Sarah. For women, the measure of the intimacy has been the measure of the oppression. Yeah. Feminism confronts the fact that women have no privacy to lose or to guarantee. Yeah. So there you have a large portion of the population that is concerned about sexual harassment, a legitimate concern, and they are persuaded by a very intelligent legal thinker that this is the source of the problem. It's not that privacy is necessary for the health of a nation. It's not that privacy is necessary for our self-esteem. It's that privacy is necessary so that men can subordinate women in the bedroom in particular. Uh, so this starts a whole theme that starts to go around sexual harassment laws and what starts to happen about sexual harassment laws. In uh, this case, O'Connor versus Ortega, 
It, this is, we hear this all the time. So 1981, there's a doctor. He's working at Napa State Hospital. He has responsibility for female interns. Rumors are out that he is misbehaving. And he has a Mac laptop. He takes it home. The uh, state hospital that he works at starts to get very worried about this guy. And they go in and they open up his desk and they take out things in his desk and they take out things in his file cabinets. And they do all the sorts of things that happen to Wilkes back in London. They just start looking for everything. So it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And Justice O'Connor, right, oops, sorry, writes the opinion. Somebody want to be Justice O'Connor? Okay, Scott. If you can hand the mic, great. Thank you. Public employees' expectations of privacy in their offices, desks, and file cabinets may be reduced by virtue of actual office practices and procedures or by legitimate regulation. Wow. So what does that mean? Exactly, what does that mean? What has what uh, this case just done in terms of the um, figured out about, remember the going inside the desk, going inside the file cabinet? Yes. Uh, um, you Peter. don't have the same rights in an office as you do in your home. You don't have the same rights in your office as you do in your home. And now we have a very important term that I have to add. I know it's going to be low, so a lot of you can't see it. But there's another way to interpret the law. And that is through expectations. If people expect that their uh, file cabinets will be open, their drawers will be open, their emails will look, be looked through, they do not have privacy. The minute you expect that things will be surveilled, you have reduced your expectations of privacy. And that's where we're getting at that, how do we give something up? Um, this case became very big because um, this is from an EEOC website talking about this case. Uh, U.S. Supreme Court first recognized Fourth Amendment privacy protection in pre-internet 1987. So there's, there's an element in what they said, in what O'Connor said, that said um, a jury will need to figure out whether or not that search was reasonable. And they remanded it back to a trial, uh, to a trial court in order to figure out. And in the trial court, they said it was unreasonable. So there is an element in this case where there is some privacy protection. Gemma, do you want to jump in? I just have to say that you skipped over two really big privacy cases. Yes. I'm sure you know which two I'm talking about. Olmstead? No. Griswold and Rowe. Yeah, right. Well, so I'm going to talk about those with the ninth. But yes. OK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks, and Gemma. I also want to say it's kind of hard to talk about the fourth without talking about the ninth and talking about the fifth as well. Right, so. right, exactly. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, and this is why, you know, we, we, we sometimes have to weave all these together. But yes, absolutely. So when we get to the Ninth Amendment, we're going to talk about Griswold and Roe and the privacy there. Um, uh, this, I'm hanging out in the fourth with this one because it's when we begin to expect that our privacy will be violated. And that's where the fourth can come in. Yes. Specific to say about this. This really applies to public employees, not private employees. Ah, we would. So Gemma is saying this just applies to public employees, not private employees, because uh, the doctor was working for a state hospital. So that was for a state hospital. But let's watch how that starts to shift. Um, because EEOC pertains, that's the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh oh, do I have that right? Close, counsel, EEOC, it applies to every place of employment with over 15 employees. Whoa, because watch one, let's see how this law gets very big. Employees' privacy expectations could be shaped and restricted by the employer's policies and practices. And this is where we start to see a big shift in employment law in terms of what are the privacy expectations at work. And it did hold that the employee had a legitimate expectation of privacy in his desk and file cabinets. So I had said earlier that, uh-oh, what's going on here? Because they're doing exactly the sort of thing that in the Wilkes case would have been completely thrown out by Lord Camden. That part about desk drawers and file cabinets, yeah, okay. 
Still, you may maintain private information there. But who Sorry. uses file cabinets anymore? Yes. One, one quick question, though, Meg. Mm -hmm. the, the Wilkes case, that was the state going into his private office, right? And this case is about the employer going into the office in right. the, on their premises of one of their employees, right? Right, right. So, I mean, th those are definitely, there's, t there's some difference there. <laughs> right, and, and so Matt's point, if you're hearing that, in the employment situation, we could say, well, hey, that's a business, um, and especially if it's a private business. Why should people have any expectations of privacy in their business, right? That seems reasonable. And the court has generally felt that to be true, but we should also begin to understand that it's happening to our psyche and how many of us actually have a clear distinction between office and home. Our lives are just way too much. So just in terms of thinking about expectations of privacy, we, we're, this is where we're starting to see big shifts. And of course, at work, everything you do is under surveillance. It's not yours. Um, and this is particularly what became the case because of uh, something else Catherine McKinnon did. Again, very brilliant person. She came up with this theory, hostile environment. Perhaps some of you have heard about this. It's, um, and it is part of Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. The harass, oh, somebody want to read this? We have a yes, Uncle Sam, do we have, yeah. Hey. And you probably have a real name. The harasser can be the victim's supervisor, an agent of the employer, a supervisor in another area, a coworker, or a non-employee. Right, so, and keep going. The yeah. victim does not have to be the person harassed, but could be anyone affected by the offensive conduct. Unlawful sexual harassment may occur without economic injury to or discharge of the victim. So this is a very broad law that applies to all businesses with more than 15 employees. And if you're an employer, you've got a lot of liability, a lot of exposure, because it doesn't necessarily even have to be the person who felt violated who's bringing the charge. It can be anybody who happens to be wandering through who feels that they uh, that they were uh, uh, subject to a hostile environment. So this is the big term, hostile environment, that allows for all sorts of um, a, a wider range of surveillance, basically. Yeah. Just a question. Non-employee could literally be anyone in the entire planet. It could be your FedEx deliverer person who comes in and witnesses something and feels there's a hostile environment. Or, cre or creates a hostile or environment, exactly. And then, and then again, so uh, employers are feeling very, very nervous, incredibly nervous. It, you could imagine that they may be all may more interested in robots. You could imagine that maybe they wouldn't want to deal with human beings anymore because it's getting a little difficult. Uh, if you have 14 human beings, you're okay. Yeah, um, and this became, yes, Sarah. Um, so Sarah's asking, how, how did they come up with that number 15? I don't know. It was probably some compromise. As they put, you know, they're enacting this legislation. So that's just the cutoff. Um, and so, yeah, Abby. That no longer stands if, if you work for a small company, you can still bring a suit for a hostile environment. If you, um, that's an interesting question. Um, uh, I think most employers now, and, and I have done some sexual harassment training, uh, if you have a small company, most employers may be saying, we're going to operate under these exact same regulations because we don't want to take a risk. That we say, no, we've only got 12 employees, we shouldn't count. People are going to put us on social media, that we let a hostile environment. At this point, people are just terrified of being accused of that. But the law itself says that. We may um, decide as employers, ah, this is, a, this is not something I even want to go near. So I'm going to post this everywhere. This became very famous for, um, with President Clinton. Uh, this is his tragic mistake. He wanted to pass the crime bill in 1994. Part of the crime bill was the Violence Against Women Act. He uh, needed, he wanted to have more partisan support. He didn't want it just to just be Democrats. So Susan Molinari was a represent, uh, Republican from New York, 
she had this amendment. She kept wanting to get in. And the amendment um, allows prosecutors to establish a pattern of sexual abuse. Nobody would take it seriously in the 90s. They're like, no, 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 you can't go doing like that. That's a fishing expedition. You can't just start looking for patterns of sexual abuse. And she felt like this was the way to deal with sex offenses. Maybe she's right. But at the time, um, Bill Clinton said, I want you on board. I will take this. And because of that, independent counsel Kenneth Starr was able to use that rule to subpoena Monica Lewinsky's private papers. And there she is. And if you haven't heard her story, she was not bringing a suit, people. Uh, Paula Jones was bringing a suit against President Clinton. And under the Molinari Amendment, uh, the prosecutors were able to go on a fishing expedition in order to establish a pattern of abuse. So they took her emails. They took love letters to the president that she never sent. She said that was the worst part. In her biography, she breaks into tears when the, the prosecutor tells her that they are going to take these private love letters. She didn't even send them, but they are going to be shared with Congress as part of the Star Report. They went to the bookstore and they found all the books that she had purchased. Now this is where the librarians started to get organized and said, we're not going to participate in this anymore. But this is what the law has been. If you are not a plaintiff in a sexual harassment lawsuit or in a trying to establish patterns of sexual abuse, you are just some random person uh, who happened to be involved with the person under investigation, you have no privacy. You have none. So, um, changing expectations of privacy. This is what they said in 1890. The right of determining ordinarily to what extent his thoughts, sentiments, and emotions shall be communicated to others that was understood as a right to privacy. This is what Monica Lewinsky looked like before. This is when she had high expectations of privacy. And I, and I'm, I know that, that you know, I'm reading a lot into her face, but I'm noticing that in the faces of ordinary citizens, we don't look that way. In fact, I think this is what we look like. We have no expectations that our thoughts, our feelings, our unexpressed ideas aren't going to go viral. And, and this is having a terrible, terrible impact on us, I think. So I'm making my case now. I'm telling you about the Fourth Amendment, and I'm also saying we got to change this big time. Um, because especially for kids who are growing up in this, since 2011, teens drink less, have sex less drive less, more prone to suicide and depression. Maybe it has nothing to do with our expectations of privacy, but it's kind of interesting how the sex fits into all this. Um, this is another chilling thing I found online. Uh, this is from the CDC. It only goes up to 2014. This line here is motor vehicle traffic injuries. Uh, these numbers are small. I don't want to exaggerate this. This is deaths per 100,000 population. Uh, but motor vehicle deaths of children 10 to 14 are going down. Homicides, that's the one on the bottom. It's staying pretty much the same. But suicide has been tracking pretty much upward. And, it's even, and this stops at 2014, and the numbers are going up. Switch, and I've gotten a lot of this material from this book I highly recommend called The Unwanted Gaze by Jeffrey Rosen. Uh, he asks, do we still value privacy? He wrote this in 2000 after Monica Lewinsky had all of her private thoughts just thrown around the countryside. And we're now we're seeing that all the time. People just grab something and throw it up on the web. We have the ability to rebuild the private spaces we have lost, but do we have the will? Yeah, Daniel. It seems to me, or at least my memory, of the Watergate break-ins, by that point in time, and I wasn't that old, 
the notion that you could stop the government or a powerful corporation from getting anything they wanted was firmly established in my friends. We, we all knew that if somebody wanted our information, we had no ability to keep it private. So Daniel's getting at a sense of there's a bunch of different ways where we give up on privacy. And this is where, what are our expectations? If our expectations are we don't have these, we don't have these. And I don't want to sound naive, but really people, if we don't think we have them, we don't have them. We may have it on print, but if we're not really taking it seriously, we don't have it. Um, and, and this is one that I feel, especially when we look at um, the rise in suicide of young people, I feel like, ah, there may be some correlation here. I think there's a public health emergency we have. And certainly, Brandeis and Warren would make that case. They thought this was a spiritual harm. Just as oftentimes you do a, a lawsuit when there's a material harm, when you've had some suffered some loss to your property, they saw these violations on privacy as spiritual harms. And, to, and they wanted us to really hold on to those. And, and that's what Jeffrey Rosen, why he wrote this book after the Lewinsky, he thought, after people see what happened to Monica Lewinsky, they're going to stop these laws. They're going to make sex, uh, hostile environment. They're going to reconsider hostile environment. And um, in fact, no. In fact, as Abby said, it sounds like we, hostile environment pertains when there's not 15 employees. Yeah, because we've now taken that on. This all sounds like 1984. Yes. Yeah. Neely says it sounds like 1984. It's exactly. Especially it's when your thoughts are going away from you. Can, can, do young people feel they can make mistakes, have an idea, and that it won't show up on the interweb? That they can have something private and then not even think about it? Yeah, Abby. Well, I think it even is coming like pre-conscious thought because of the parents putting their own children on social media. And so even before you are able to articulate your thoughts, you already know that you're a public figure. Yeah, Abby is talking about how if people are putting their kids on, on social media, getting those pictures up, and I want to make sure I'm, I'm hearing yeah. you right because uh, you didn't have a mic. And, and so that because of that, there's this expectation now that there is no privacy? Yeah. Right. Even in our, just like in our fundamental consciousness, we don't believe that that is a right that we have. Yeah, Abby's saying in our fundamental consciousness, we don't believe that is a right we have. Or this new generation is not going to have that. Exactly, yeah. And this is why uh, child psychologists are incredibly worried about social media. And that's different than Daniel and his friends back in the Watergate era when they were thinking, whoa, big, you know, Uncle Sam is out of control, or Big Brother 1984 is out of control. Now it's us doing it to ourselves. Who's a hand back there? Yes. Thank you, the Patriot. Yeah. Here comes the mic. <laughs> what side? Okay. Uh, thank the Patriot Act. With the Patriot Act, we lost a lot of uh, the rights that people are not aware of. Yeah. Because the government agents then can go into your house and invade uh, your privacy. Right. Right. So, so government, I mean, and this is what the Fourth Amendment is supposed to stop, especially very much focused on government actors. Yeah, right, and, and we have a hand up here. You know, um, two things. Um, when um, the government went into the, the lawyer's office and took those files on, uh, what was it? Uh, the, um, the Wilkes case, the early no, case? Just, just recently. Oh. Um, oh. With the um, Mueller report, it went, they went into the um, government office and took files from, from a lawyer. Michael Cohen. Michael, Michael, Cohen. Cohen. Michael Cohen. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, I like cringed at that. Uh -huh. You know, you're supposed to have privacy between yourself and your lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I thought, there are some things I would never tell my lawyer that if, right. if they can get into that. Right. And the second thing is that um, you have no right to keep quiet or to tell a lie or to or keep quiet to Congress, special investigators, federal officials, and we learned this through the Mueller report when they were investigating. And you have no right to you know, like, um, I, I don't want to self-incriminate myself, but you, but you can't not testify. 
So, I'm, so I, I want to make sure we're, because we're giving all this away. Many and people who uh, appeared before Congress did take the fifth, right? So we we are still seeing that actively used. Not as much in the Mueller report. It, I, I'm just thinking about when the people uh, yeah. went in front of Congress. Am I yeah. making this up, right? Uh, many people said, "I'm going to take the fifth," and and it's and uh, and that's interesting, just in terms <clears throat> of really holding on to certain rights very strongly. I have the right, and yes, it may not have gone well because then people said, well, he took the fifth, therefore he must be guilty. But in terms of the actual proceeding, I think people take that one pr pretty seriously. But what we're seeing here is more with uh, expectations of privacy are decreased. I didn't, I didn't see that in the Mueller report. They, they insisted that you mm -hmm. answer the question and they insisted uh -huh. that you give an honest Right. Interpretation. Right. And yes. I, I didn't. I didn't see too many people being able to take the fifth when they were brought before the Mueller uh, um, commission. Right. Right. Yeah. And and that being not a judicial body, a congressional body. So, um, I I just have a couple more slides, and and the last slide is actually going to open this up, and then we want to make sure we get to hear the amendment again. Um, somebody sent me this picture right before I came to tonight's talk. This is how to be secure in your person. So we found that um, placemat, or no, what is it, welcome mat that said, go back, go away if you don't have a warrant. Well, you know what she's got on her, you know what this is? It's the Fourth Amendment, but why does it look like this? It's been what? It's, well, it's, and those are all um, license plates. This is called, uh, her name is Kate Rose, it's called Adversarial Fashion, and it's designed to confound, confound surveillance cameras, which are always looking for license plates. <laughs> so you wear this, and the cameras go, <laughs> and it has the Fourth Amendment on it. Yeah, so that's, that's one way. This, is, this was just in The Guardian. Um, but I have some, a couple of questions for you before we move to the, to the final rendition of the Fourth Amendment. What do you think? This is a hot topic question. What will we gain if we saw sexual harassment as a violation of privacy, not gender discrimination? What would that look like if somebody who's in the office not feeling very uh, well respected is feeling like somebody is doing that violation that we have heard about, all those torts, and they would bring that kind of a case and it would be, uh, you just violated my privacy. This is what Jeffrey Rosen recommends. It may not be gender discrimination. I mean, I guess, given what gender to what gender, I guess it could always be considered either discrimination well, but, so just to set the stage, right. currently this is gender res discrimination. Right. Sexual harassment is part of the uh, Civil Rights Act, Title VII, right. Section 3. So, so that I, is how it is. So if I hit on a guy at work, mm -hmm. I am discriminating against him because of his gender? Correct. And this is why g uh, gender discrimination has some problems. Okay. It, it's not working, especially in a, in a gender binary, uh, post-gender binary and all sorts of things. It's just not working. I'm Peter. just wondering if it was a value, it was considered a violation of privacy rather than gender discrimi discrimination, if that would be a stronger um, corollary with the Fourth Amendment. Right. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And we would get to hear that term a lot more, privacy. And then just, we, we might take it more seriously. Yeah, we'd build it back up. And, and so that might, you know, hey, if anybody's looking for a new social movement, this might be a good one. <laughs> Because it is, it, and because sexual harassment law continues to grow, 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 and there are a lot of people, particularly on the Democratic side of the aisle, who are pushing to expand it, and there's not, doesn't seem to be much pushback about, well, say, what is this doing to privacy? And it also uh, is not necessarily solving the problem. The statistics are not going away, even as the law gets stronger. So maybe we need to try something different. When Jeffrey Rosen wrote this in 2000, nobody paid any attention to him. But maybe now we've seen how it goes on. Uh, Neely. Is this, it, the word harassment also en encompasses other things than sexual harassment. And that is actually, I know of a case where that has become a real issue. And people get, uh, 
they, they simply get accused of harassment right. for creating a hostile work environment that has nothing to do with sexual anything. Right. And it's exactly the sort of thing that was described before. Basically, anyone can do it yeah. and say, you have created a hostile workplace. Right. Yeah, does every, did everybody here, Neely, you, you, it, the law has now expanded. You can do something called emotional um, abuse. And so there, nobody may be aroused, but there may be a sense of violation. And, and, and hostile environment will pertain, which is this enormous. You don't have to prove it either. You, don't, you just say it. You just say it. It's, it uh, this expectation is subjective in trying to determine. Uh, so here's another one. What it, would we gain if we address teenage suicide as a symptom of privacy violations? Would that give us something to start to think about this problem in a new way? Um, so that rather than, um, in terms of looking for a cause, sometimes the cause is blame the parents. The parents aren't around enough. Or um, access too much time on the screen. So the screen itself becomes the problem. Or um, video games or bullying. So there's all these things, uh, uh, explanations for teenage suicide. What if we thought about as, as invasion of privacy? Would that give us something to think about? Well, all the teenage suicides that I know uh, uh, come about because people are outed. And that is clearly a privacy issue. Exactly. I mean, there are so many where if we understood it as an invasion of privacy, again, yeah, Abby. Well, and bullying also. Yes. <laughs> is coming, you know, often on social media, and that is also can be clearly seen as an invasion of privacy. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Peter. That reminds me of, I read this, the book Shaming, I think it's called, mm -hmm. where um, a tweet was amplified thousands of times that was, un, you know, just, un, just it was a stupid joke, amplified thousands of times. And I wondered if that has been come up as a legal issue in terms of just the thing we can do now we couldn't do before in terms of amplifying something by retweeting it. Right, and, and that is what Warren and um, Brandeis were really getting at, that you, when things get retweeted, you've just lost all this important stuff about yourself, and it's such an invasion of privacy. Yeah, in the back, and then we'll go to Abby. I just wanted to point out that that slide was about suicide was for 10 to 14-year-olds, which is uh, way smaller than if it had gone from 14 to 24. Thank you, yeah. And what do you think it would have looked like had it gone to... Oh. I'm sure that it would have been much more of a rise. Yes. It's, it's not common for a 10 or 11 year old to be able actually to co commit suicide. Right, right, exactly. Thank you, yeah. Objection, Objection. the yeah. presenter is leading the witness. Yeah, <laughs> this is not a court, Daniel, we're not in the courtroom. But I appreciate it. Abby had her hand up. Um, I just am thinking about, you know, when we're, um, please. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. I'm just thinking about um, when we're looking at this from like a retweet, mm -hmm. you're giving permission when you engage in social media, you're giving permission to other people to violate your privacy. So this is not, it can't really be addressed legally. It's more of like on a, a cultural level that we have to look at this now. Cause the legal, yeah. I don't, I don't know if we're, if, if I'm putting something on social media, I'm accepting the loss of my privacy there. Right. I'm doing that to myself. Yeah, so and, and did everybody, we have the mic, so everybody heard Abby. Um, Charlie, do you want to respond to what Abby was saying or you want to add to this? Yes. So I think another thing that's really important is how in the media age, every time we sign up for a new website, we click agree on the terms and conditions and you don't know how much you gave up, like how many rights you gave up by saying, yes, I agree so I can use the service. Yeah. And so I think that there is this notion ingrained in us that is, if we want to connect with other people, then we have to give up our privacy in order to do so. Yes, wow, that really just hit it. So this does have to be a cultural change. Abby was wondering, like, the law, it's not going to be the law, it's going to be through culture. If the culture changes, the law will change. And if people begin to say, hey, you violated my privacy, and I'm now going to file a suit, and these are, I'm gone to my restatement of torts, and I'm showing you all the ways in which you spiritually damaged me, and I'm going to get some nice uh, payment out of this situation, thank you very much, that's going to start to change the culture. 
We, I mean, the law changed enormously when we had hostile environment, and now people all of a sudden assume, okay, that's the liability. That's what it's going to be now in order to end sexual harassment. Sexual harassment hasn't gone away, but we've come to expect that that law is the way it is. We, we just need to change our expectations. So uh, just because we're starting to run out of time, and I so want to hear from our singers, some of whom have traveled all the way from Connecticut, I, I'll, I'll leave you with this question, how do you want to interpret the Fourth Amendment? And maybe we could hear the singers, and then we could all think about it. You don't have to share it, because it's your private thought. Yes, but before, one, one before the singers, as the singers are getting ready. Yes, Michaela. Oh, is this? Yes, thank you. Um, I feel like this is a little bit of a troublemaking question, but Good. I just have to ask, because um, I didn't realize this was part of a whole series, and I really appreciate you for putting this on. And I really came tonight being especially extremely horrified and concerned about what is happening to the privacy of people who are being taken from their homes yes. out of, outside of their will. And I just, I just, I have to put that here mm -hmm. in this conversation and I have to ask for some mm -hmm. guidance on how to apply the Fourth Amendment to what is happening to people who may or may not be citizens. You know, we don't uh -huh. know, mm -hmm. or, or the people going in don't, don't necessarily right. know, but I just like, that's so important to me yeah. right now, so I can't leave this room without. Right. Right. Bringing it in. Great. And, and, and Gemma wants to jump in on that. To Gemma that. wants to respond. So there's a couple of things I want to say before we leave. The first one is I was chuckling about uh, when you were asking about where is the common law codified. And the answer to that is really everywhere and nowhere. The, I mean, it, the, the common law is the body of law that has been developed over the centuries. The mm -hmm. English do not have a written constitution like we have. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that this is gonna come up next month when mm -hmm. you do the Fifth Amendment, mm -hmm. but there's a very big difference between the Fourth and Fifth Amendment in that the Fourth Amendment specifies the people, yeah. and the Fifth Amendment specifies no person. Mm -hmm. Very, very different laws. Mm -hmm. uh, the term, the people, is now definitely codified in our law, and this goes back to last month with Heller v. D.C., which cited uh, U.S. v. Verdugo or Orquidez, which is the case that really establishes what does, what does the Constitution mean when it says the people? Mm -hmm. And so who are these people who are protected by the Fourth Amendment? And they are people who have established a significant relationship with the country. The case of Verdugo Riquitas involved a case where U.S. agents invaded an apartment in Mexico City looking for evidence of a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Supreme Court ruled that Verdugo Riquitas had absolutely no expectation or protection from the U.S. Constitution mm -hmm. simply because it took place outside of U.S. borders, even though it was U.S. government agents who mm -hmm. conducted the illegal search. Right, right. So. Right, so, thank you. So, I mean, but so what about so much is happening within these borders? So, yeah. so can you direct me a little further to, to how to understand and... Yeah, Stand maybe up. and maybe we could have that conversation after because that feels like very important information. Yeah, but just yeah. briefly, yeah. there's a very large legal question right now of mm. people who are undocumented immigrants to mm. the United States of whether or not they qualify as the people. Right, right. And 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 I think also just in terms of thinking about the tragedy that you're describing, Michaela, and thank you for bringing this into it. For us as a nation to be taking privacy rights seriously then yes, and Gemma's point is, is really important in terms of what is the Supreme Court recognizing as pertaining broadly to just bodies who show up here and what pertains just to citizens. So there's always that. But behind that is this basic understanding of basic privacy expectations. Warren and Brandeis, they were writing about a cultural disposition for us to take that seriously. Yes. One last quick point. Yes. Nowhere in the Bill of Rights is the word citizen used. Mm -hmm. Right, great. And in the original text of the Constitution, it's only used in conjunction with eligibility for certain offices and mm -hmm. uh, jurisdiction for the courts. Right, right, Sorry. thank you. Thank you for that. Awesome, okay. I love it, thank you. I hope you understand how I feel about all these things <laughs> or the way I said it to these. <laughs> Sing it that way, guys. Uh -huh. Can you project the... The right 
of the people to be secure. The right of the people to be secure. The right of the people to be secure. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects. In their persons, houses, papers, and effects. Against unreasonable searches and seizures. See you. 